Hello, everyone, all those on board and all those out there, I believe 132 registrants uh, so far. And it, on behalf of SEMA, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to what promises to be in an exciting Adda. The topic, what is the role of the arts in a time of global crisis can mean many things. At, it, at first, it appears very simple. You might think it means art and COVID-19 or COVID-19 and chaos as represented in art, or it might mean what is the role of art to reflect or relieve? Do the two merge? If there are global crises, is there a global art? Does it become art when it is responding to global as opposed to local issues and crises? Does it work in the opposite way as well? Can local art respond to global events like crafts? Not only pandemics and wars, but also, for instance, humans on Mars. And now I hand it over to, uh, I'll introduce all of you to each other. And I will begin with the moderator, Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, who is uh, a renowned historian and author. Dr. Mukherjee has taught history at the University of Calcutta and held visiting appointments at uh, Princeton University University of Manchester and University of California, Santa Cruz. He is internationally acclaimed as a historian of the revolt of 1857 in India. And he was for several years, the editor of the editorial pages uh, at the Telegraph newspaper here in, in Calcutta. And currently he is professor of history at Ashoka and the chancellor of Ashoka University. Um, as I introduce all of you, maybe wave or, you know, just so that the attendees know. Um, then we have Mr. Harsh Neotia, uh, who is the chairman of the Ambuja Neotia Group. Uh, his work in social housing earned Mr. Neotia the honor of being conferred with the Padma Shri, one of India's most uh, premier. Uh, national um, citations that we give, the government gives. He is also a recipient of the YPO Legacy of Honor Award. And he was recently conferred with the DLIT by Vidya Sagar University, West Bengal. And he has uh, represented several bodies in, in the corporate and financial uh, world, as well and to educational institutions and his support for the arts is, is very well known. And that's why I, I invited him because I thought he, he could give the perspective of from the corporate business side, as well as from the side of someone who is passionate about art. And then it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Pankaj Panwar, who's a professor at uh, Kala Bhavod Bishop Bharati University, which is in Shantiniketan. Um, Pankaj Panwar is a professor in sculpture at Bishop Bharati University. And after training at Kala Bhavan Shantiniketan and doing his MS at, um, at MS University Baroda, he proceeded to the Royal College of Art in London in 1989. And Pankaj is the recipient of several scholarships and uh, fellowships, such as the Charles Wallace Grant, Henry Moore Fellowship, and the French Government Scholarship. And he's participated in numerous shows uh, across India. And then we have, and I'm going by the order of, of the poster, so you'll, you'll forgive me for flipping the pages. Chhatrapati Dr. Hello. Hello, everybody. 
artist and currently principal of the Government College of Art and Craft here in Calcutta. Chhatrapati Datto is a skilled multimedia artist and his practice explores the issues of post-colonial India. He taught at the Faculty of Visual Art, Robindra Bharati University from 1995 to 2007. And his journey as an artist grew from painting to making objects and further into the realm of new media and installation. And he's presented and conducted several local, national and international workshops, lectures and symposiums through the years. And he's written also, written many essays, columns and reviews for several uh, periodicals and art journals and uh, contributed to in several art institutions. Um, some of the exhibitions that he's participated in are uh, following the box in the USA, India Art Fair 2016, New Delhi um, Art for Concern at the Oberoi Grant Kolkata, and the Asian Art Biennale in Bangladesh in 2014 and a show called Go See India in Sweden. And then we have um, Monica Shai, director of the American Center here in Calcutta. She is the Council for Public Affairs and uh, where she's responsible for press relations, cultural affairs and educational activities that articulate US foreign policy and promote greater mutual understanding between um, our two countries, that is between USA and, and India. Um, Ms. Shai is a, is a diplomat, but um, prior to becoming an, a, a diplomat, she, Ms. Shai taught language and literature at the City University of New York. Then we have somebody from the world of theater um, and cinema, Koshik Sen. Koshik Sen is, is a celebrated uh, actor on stage, which is his first passion. He, he was very, uh, he very pointedly told me that when I was inviting him to participate in, in this uh, discussion. Uh, so he's an actor on stage, film and television. And he's the director of a very well-known theater group here Swapno Shonhani. He has acted in and produced many critically acclaimed plays for close to almost 30 years. And his film repertoire is, is uh, very well known. He's worked with um, major directors like Mrinal Sen, and he's had several um, commercial successes in um, cinema. So that is our, um, I think I've got everyone covered. Oh, you missed out Helen. Oh, 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 yes, of course, Helen, of course, I'm so sorry. Yes, Helen and Ilan, yeah. Yeah. So, Helen's, um, Helen Dratt English and her contributions to the modern and contemporary craft uh, movement has been vast. She was a founding member of the Philadelphia Council of Professional Craftsmen. In 1973, she authored the first college level syllabus on the history of modern craft and founded the Helen Drutt Gallery. Helen has curated several major exhibitions like 10 Potters in 1971. And then we have Poetics of Clay, an international perspective in uh, 2002 and jewelry from 1964 to 1994, the Helen Williams <coughs> collection, which has traveled to 11 museums internationally from 1984 to 1995. Helen has received honors and awards from several prestigious institutions, such as the American Craft Council, National Museum of Women in Washington, DC, Museum of Art and Design, New York, and the Philadelphia Art Alliance. She is a member of the International Academy of uh, Ceramics. And now we come to um, Ilan, Ilan Auerbach, 
Ilan Avabak is a sculptor who was born in Israel, but now lives and works mostly in New York. His sculptures have been featured in gallery and museum exhibitions, as well as installed permanently in public spaces across the United States, Israel, Canada, Switzerland, France, India, in Calcutta, there are two of his pieces here, and Germany. So, um, and if I may introduce myself, I am um, Pratiti Boshusharkar, uh, technically chief administrator at Sima Gallery, but my uh, designation is Darth Vader. So, welcome all of you. And it's, I am very excited and really looking forward uh, to this evening's uh, event. Uh, Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, I now hand it over to you. And as Maurice Sendak said in his famous Where the Wild Things Are, let the rumpus start. <laughs> so, uh, I would like to begin by a very obvious statement, but being a student of history, the statement is important to me that this is not most certainly not the first global crisis on which perhaps it's not even the last global crisis that art is facing. And in that catch-all category, I include artists of various kinds from painters to writers to sculptors to uh, poets, uh, theater actors and so on or every single form of our manifestation of art that we can think of. Uh, the world has experienced global crises. Art, art critics, art appreciators, teachers of art, they have all responded to such crises in the past. And I, I think we are also, all these various categories of people that I named, they are also in their own way responding to the current crisis as well. Uh, it may not be evident all the time, but they are responding. That is the, the nature of people who engage in art, that they are always uh, in some form or the other, uh, interacting, not necessarily reflecting, but interacting with reality that is around them. The expression of that interaction might vary might vary from the abstract to the very realistic, but nonetheless, it is the product of an interaction with reality. I thought I would actually begin today's panel discussion uh, with a practitioner. So I will ask Ilan Avogok to speak first about how as an artist, a sculptor, uh, at a time when the world around all of us is actually has been at a standstill for the last eight, nine months uh, in many ways. How has he responded to this situation in terms of his creative expression? And what does he feel his role has been as an artist in this, under these circumstances? Um, Ilan, uh, the microphone is all yours for the next five, seven minutes, and we will come back later. To... Okay. So, you know, um, I was uh, in my studio in New York uh, when it all started. I just came from installing a sculpture in Israel and uh, uh, in the Bourse areas of uh, Tel Aviv, and uh, I got sick. And I don't know what kind of sickness I had. It was for a few weeks and there was no testing at the time. And uh, I ended up in my studio and waiting for it to go away. And then eventually the world closed on us and I just continued to work. So my immediate uh, response was as an artist to continue to work. And I have a situation which is comfortable. I, I live in one floor and the base, the, the the first floor is my studio. So I try, I continue to travel, but between my domicile and my studio, and continue uh, to work. I also was quite prepared in terms of 
uh, materials and I had two projects to finish, one for a bridge for the Como Bridge in New York and another one for uni uh, a university in Texas, which I just came uh, a week ago from after I finished it. So, you know, it caught me in a, a in a good and a bad way. And I, it, I was, I could continue to work. And so I was one of the privileged ones. Um, but of course, you know, uh, all of a sudden we lost uh, contact with museum, we lost contact with uh, cinemas, with theater, you know, and uh, and you are close at home with your family, a close family, wife, uh, and um, that's it, no friends. And, and this medium became the medium, uh, you know, the Zoom uh, and the conversation and, um, you know, I didn't plan to be this year. I, I, I visit often India, but I didn't plan to be this one, this year in India. But here we are. I am in India now. Um, and so it's nice. Uh, the, the form is nice. Uh, but uh, back to the topic of, of um, what is art in terms of in a time of crisis. So there are crises and there are crises. This one was so uh, unusual for me. Uh, because, you know, there is nowhere to escape to. I always have this uh, idea that you can escape to the Amazon or somewhere in the jungle, you know, when uh, the next nu nuclear war comes. And the tributaries of the Amazon are the most rampant with the COVID-19. And so there is nowhere to escape to. And um, not to India and not to Israel and not to where all the places I'm connected to. And and so I had to sort of continue to deal with it within my domicile, within. And art for me is an instinct. It's an unconscious instinct. It's not like uh, what we do now, where we use a language to describe uh, what we should do or what we shouldn't do, uh, how we are connected. It's an instinct. Uh, it's a language, parallel to language. And so it's something that... Uh, you just engage in it in a kind of uh, instinctual, unconscious way. And it, it has been talked about as such for um, generations. But and, and when we look at it backward, we see that it always deals with the situation, metaphorically, not directly, uh, but um, people follow it and people uh, engage in it and investigate it and write history book about it. Uh, as parallel to the big events of the world. So obviously, if we take, we extrapolate from that, it is something that um, is, we, we just, uh, it's big part of what's happening right now. And hopefully, since I am saying it's instinctual and unconscious, I don't know what I'm doing it about, but I'm doing. And that's the kind of, the essence of, of, of it. Uh, I don't know that there is a difference between the projects that I got before the pandemic and um, the way I continued through the pandemic. I had no assistant. I had to be doing it alone. It's a very large scale work. And, and I did. And I actually found the kind of enjoyment in the difference in daily life as it was before. You know, all of a sudden I was in a quiet environment not full of people and things like that. So um, it's it's where where it is going. I cannot tell, but I understand that this is what I really need to do. Thank you, Ilan. And uh, I much appreciate this point about that an artist uh, needs to constantly engage, and whatever the situation, an artist cannot withdraw or refuse to in, withdraw from engagement or refuse to engage. So an artist's work in one sense is continuous. An artist's work never really is ever finished. So we'll come back to this point later. I want to bring in Koshik at this stage because as, uh, as he always says, uh, theater is his first passion. And uh, there is no theater at the moment uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> So, you know, but Koshik, my question is of a different order. Performance 
uh, which constitutes such a large part of theater. Performance is not just an external performance. Of course, when you are on stage, you are performing externally with gestures, with language, and so on and so forth. But any serious acting process needs an internal preparation. There's a deep interiority to acting. And I would like to ask you, in this period of global crisis, when theater is actually shut down, when shootings also of TV serials and cinema were also shut down, have you been able to, in any way, develop your interiority? And what, how have you been doing that as a performer on stage who is actually left without the stage at the, under the present circumstances, circumstances, how are you being honing your skills as an actor, as a performer, as a director? Have you been thinking about future projects, future plays to put on and so on and so forth? I think we would like to, this one way in which you have engaged with uh, the global crisis, we'd like to hear about that from you, Koshi. Thank you, Rudran Shuda. Uh, you know, the, uh, all the actors throughout the world, across the globe, if you ask them what are the most important features of a good actor, uh, everyone would say one very important point that he is a good actor who, can, who listens well. You know, there are some times uh, you, you make out an actor who is a good actor you can make it out from his facial expression that that particular actor is waiting uh, for, his, the, the, for the cue. I mean, he's not properly listening to his co-actor. He's just waiting for his lines to vomit. He is not a good actor. The good actor is the one who is not only equipped with his dialogues, but he's also is the one who listens properly to his co-actor. So this is the time for a theater practitioner to listen very carefully. For so many years, we are performing, performing, uh, full of performances, particularly theater. Uh, theater is not that kind of an art which can be performed uh, on your own. You need a team. It's a team effort. And theater is a collective art. So uh, since that has stopped, but the time is very interesting for theater as well, because this is the crucial time where we, the performers, the theater practitioners, we have some time to, to stop and rethink. Particularly, we must listen to the powerful people all around us, throughout the world, even in our country. What they, have, uh, what they are saying uh, about their lies, and the, the more they will talk, and I can assure you, the more will they caught, they will be caught. So the theater, in the, for what, what, what theater we are going to do in future depends on how well we listen to them now, how well we listen to the surroundings right now. And theater is very much closely related with the community. So, uh, after this phase is over, we must try to connect theater more and more with the community because theater is absolutely uh, not existent without the support of the community. And, uh, and we are waiting the things to get over. But at the same time, if you talk about, if you, if you ask me about the practice, what kind of a practice, an actor should do right at this moment when there is no stage, when my teammates are away from me, when we don't have a proper theater space. My answer is that this is the time to listen. Uh, for so many years, we have been so busy performing. We are busy with our dialogues. But as I said, that he is the good actor who, can, who also listens to his co-actor patiently as if whether he, he knows his dialogues, he knows the dialogues of his co-actors also. But 
an actor, a good actor is that one who listens to his co-actor properly as if he's listening that for the first time. So this is the time for a theater practitioner to listen and to prepare himself very silently. Thank you, Koshik. Uh, I'd like to bring in our two teachers, uh, one from Kolagavon and the other from the Government College of Art, one after the other. So I'll start with Chhatrapati uh, Dotto and then move on to Pankaj. The big question, of course, and I, I, I won't repeat the question. This is the big question, and both of you can respond one after the other. With, first with Chhatrapati Dotto. Can art be taught online? You're both teachers, you're professors of one of sculpture and the other is uh, in the Government College of Art. How are you teaching? How are you teaching the students? Can art actually be taught online? We, are, we have been pushed into a situation where all our teaching, I myself am a teacher, all our teaching has gone onto the screen. There is no physical interaction with students anymore. So as teachers of art, how have, been, how have you been coping with this aspect of the global crisis? And the big question is, do you think art can be taught online? Chhatrapati Dattu, if you come in first and then Pankaj can take over from there. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Uh, yeah, fundamentally, I think uh, there are two aspects to art teaching uh, in the current situation. Uh, and all, possibly all academic institutions uh, have more or less the same system. We have, we have a theoretical part and we have a practical part. And which is, of course, the theoretical part is a much later addition in the great pedagogic practice. Uh, practices of art. But uh, this is one portion, as you said, can be done through screen and as uh, many other uh, institutions and many other subjects are being taught, can be taught. Art history can be taught. You can project images, you can uh, discuss uh, uh, historical situations and uh, social connotations and of course teach art history as might be. But uh, when it comes to uh, real practice, I think when it comes to tools, when it comes to uh, uh, technical matters when it comes to really handling of material. I think there is uh, such a physicality in the whole practice. There is uh, uh, such a need for demonstration uh, mm -hmm. and, and real connection between the, uh, the experienced and the inexperienced, the one who is uh, imparting the knowledge and the one who is uh, really uh, being uh, uh, educated. I think the the sort of directness of it uh, is very important uh, when you know uh, 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 a student needs to be taught how exactly to hold a chisel and how to hammer when you are actually handling a stone or when how different it is when you're handling marble or how different it will become when possibly you're handling clay. So uh, I think it's uh, quite impossible what is possible is maybe at a, at a higher level when things go beyond the practicalities of it. And when it comes to actually uh, getting into areas which are um, more uh, theoretical in terms of uh, language, in terms of, uh, you know, really um, talking about concepts, at that level possibly, you know, with a master degree batch, possibly you can uh, go on with certain amount of classes where we get into theoretical discussions. Uh, and uh, basically that is what they need then. They don't need the day-to-day -day aid of how you handle material or how you actually get used to a new uh, sort of a subject within the given sphere that you are specializing in. So apart from that, I think there is uh, one more important aspect we need to understand when we are talking of online as to where and how we exist. I mean, given the situation today that you can possibly uh, use the same credit card in Shundarbon and in San Francisco, somehow or the other, the situation in both these places are not the same. 
And it is extremely difficult for uh, 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 institutions like us, where we have students from uh, extreme interiors, from districts where possibly there is very uh, few, even in you know cyber cafes where there is internet access, where electricity itself is rare. So there are situations which go beyond just uh, this whole concept of online teaching. There are practicalities we still haven't arrived at at a greater uh, socio-political level. And thus, I think many things that are being discussed today or being said about uh, education are actually uh, uh, completely uh, 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 displaced. We, we don't know actually whom we are teaching. We possibly, if you are saying these things, uh, uh, we, are, we are addressing the wrong audience. So I feel it's uh, uh, important to understand uh, whom we are addressing and at what situations today. A lot of decisions are being taken. And uh, I think a lot of those decisions will be challenged in future and will show the adverse effects of these decisions in times to come. Thank you, Chaturvedi. Pankaj, would you like to come in now? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, given your experience, we would like you to emphasize the sculptured part of the teaching of art, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it's rather than the painting side. These are two different, yeah, exactly. uh, different features of art, and I dare say the pedagogy is also different. How you teach painting and how you teach sculpture, I mean, that's also different. Exactly. So, uh, how do you do it online? Can it be done online? Are you satisfied with doing it online? You know, I mean, we are left with no choice. The situation is such that we are fighting. Uh, invisible enemy. So we are in a situation when the lockdown is almost like six, seven, eight months. So you are not left with any choice that you have to do something if you have to run the class. Especially as Chatro has de uh, described the problem with the practical fields, art and design. There, it's it's not easy to teach online, and especially sculpture where a lot of physicality use of material and, uh, and uh, technical aspects are very much. So that is, uh, you know, the relatively, if the 2D subject, for example, painting, just painting, or like in printmaking or other things, there are technical things, which becomes very difficult, especially sculpture is very difficult because the main thing of sculpture is working with material. Having said that, and the second thing is that we are not at a stage where we, our technology is as developed. Perhaps in future, if technology is developed to the level in, in teaching method also, like, like in, in, in medicine or medic, medical doctors, they are doing operations and surgical is this thing from the distance. So their methodology and everything is so refined. In art, we are suddenly pushed into situation, institutions are pushed into situation where we have to find solutions. So it is true that we are struggling. And as, 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 uh, as you know, we are, what we are doing is how to, you know, how to improvise, how to be more innovative. For example, in sculpture, they don't have, they don't have access to all the materials. They live in remote areas, especially in India. Some students are living in a very remote area. But another thing is in the sculpture, now it is not limited to conventional mediums like bronze or stone or wood. You know, the sculpture has gone really revolutionized itself as far as material goes. Anish Kapoor has done powder sculpture with simply a powder and the sand. So that is the way we can use students to think something innovatively, use mud, use sand, use brick, so there are ways you have to, you know, really dig deep to find answers. So no doubt it is a challenging time, but I must say this challenging time is pushing us also to find answers in a difficult uh, technological wise, how the to improvise. The crisis is pushing you to innovate. The crisis is pushing you to innovate. That is, that is the mother of all innovation. So I don't always think it is, it is, it is difficult, but I think it may have, because suddenly it is, it is true that we are making a shift jump technologically. Suddenly in Shantaniket and Kalavan, 
in our setting we are interacting on zoom and talking to students and this uh, because in art it is only not only the work it is the discussing the ideas you can do lot of drawings you can develop your concepts and it is you know maybe in 2 3 months time when the college will open by the time they are ready with their body of work to execute in material so there are lot of ways it is challenging no doubt but i am looking it as a from different perspective that we have to find in challenging time different answers thank thank you thank you pankaj uh, helen i'd like to bring you in here at this point uh and the situation is slightly parallel to what we were talking about when koshik when i brought in koshik so as an art critic as somebody uh, you know who interacts with museums craft councils and places like that so in a in a very vital sense that link has been snapped i mean you can't go to museums uh, you can't go and see how craftsmen are working you can't visit an artist in his studio so what does a critic do what does a person like you do in such a situation how do you keep interest in art alive uh, in this kind of situation where we are like it or not we are housebound most of the time uh actually uh, i must say that i have found this to be a really important phase in my life i i am basically an educator and i and i have found the isolation since the end of march almost rewarding i have been able to write i have a research assistant that comes three mornings or three out days a week she stays on the third floor i'm on the second floor we've been organizing my library so that the library can be used by other scholars and artists and other people who are interested in in my field uh we have uh, gone through the library and we have created the doubles that will go to temple university to form an art library for them uh i have found that zoom has been extraordinary i have zoom meetings with artists from australia from munich from England from from even my own city so that I've been able to have communication and I've been able to engage in communication and and to learn even beyond the my uh, beyond any other time because I have the time to do that I began to really love the isolation I told somebody I had my own ashram <laughs> I was able to to really take hold of this time in my life as i'm approaching my 90th birthday to organize and to coordinate and to and to see that information goes to different nonprofit institutions and 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 as far as the museums are concerned i am working with curators i have meetings with curators sometimes two or three times a week and i have and i have thought that the museums they must draw from their own resources and collections now they must realize that they are in a a devastating period because funding is not there resources are not there black matters lives has changed the way in which artists are selected in which acquisitions are are decided in which the administrative staff is formed and it's time that that has happened but also the museums really must look at their own resources walter benjamin once said i think that uh <laughs> walter benjamin once said that that work should should not remain in eternity in an air conditioned environment and and the museums must look at their resources and they must look at their at their at the at at at, at the off off you know they must look at all the sites in which material is installed i remember when robert wilson went to the boymans museum about 20 years ago and he developed exhibitions from their sources so that they don't have to create exhibitions from outside sources right now they don't have the money to do that so i have found that it's been a time in which my cre creative energy and my and my my interest in scholarship 
has had the time to expand and to, and also to become organized. Uh, we spent the last two weeks just working on a chronology of events that were very important in the resurgence of the crafts in the United States. So I, I'm, I'm not looking at this time as a time, I know it's crisis, the crisis is economic, the crisis is medical. You know, I'm worried about those people who can't afford to sustain their livelihood. But I also have found that in my field, I've been able to become very cohesive and I've been able to maintain incredible relationships with artists. I'm now preparing, I'm preparing bundles. One artist asked me for maple syrup and granola, <laughs> but I'm just, you know, it's a silly thing. But the point is that Zoom has permitted us to have a kind of communication with people and institutions all over the world that has never happened before. I am concerned very, very deeply, and I, I'm very concerned about what is happening to teaching. I'm concerned about the fact that there's no human contact. I don't know how a metalsmith could create a brooch without being able to solder in front of his teacher. I, I'm, I'm concerned that the lack of human contact also isolates us. Um, I mean, so these are, these are my concerns and this is the way in which I'm, I'm trying to positively deal with the crisis and, uh, and also to reach out to other institutions and nonprofit organizations and, and, and create a core for education and learning. Thank you, Helen. Uh I'd like to bring in Harsh here uh, as the next on the panel and ask him a very specific question. Uh, Harsh, uh, everybody knows you as a patron of the arts uh, and uh, you're one of Calcutta's best known and biggest patrons. And those of us who have had the fortune of uh, visiting your house, uh, we also know that you are surrounded by art of various different kinds. Uh, and uh, so I would like to ask you that in this time of crisis, when I presume even as an active, very active entrepreneur and businessman, you have largely been housebound, has this collection of art, which is all around you in your house, has it offered you some kind of solace, inspiration, uh, a justification for life, if you like, to may use a very big phrase. Uh, how have you reflected on, uh, on your collection, all, which is all around you, as I say? Uh, you know, so you are now more than a patron uh, because actually you, one would like to think you, you are now enjoying and appreciating the art that you have collected even more than you were before because you, you have the leisure and the time to look at that art. Would you like to respond to that? Yes, it's interesting you asked this question. Uh, it is so very true that uh, a lot of stuff that was lying at home was not given that kind of uh, deep look that perhaps we were able to do during this period. And it was for various reasons. Uh, because you had the time, you also thought that let us uh, see whether they are in good condition. So you have actually gone and tried to look at every piece of art to see, you know, sometimes there is moisture and fungus and some other things. And we were able to identify many that needed restoration, which were then kept aside. So that was one. The other, of course, is that in the hullabaloo of life, you don't... Uh, take a proper stocking of everything. So we decided to catalog it and start writing uh, photographing it. Of course, all amateur, but then started putting it together so that we at least have a list of the stuff that we have. Um, not that it's of uh, any public use, but at least that we ourselves know what is lying where. So these are a couple of things that we did. And naturally, while we were doing this, uh, we were able to uh, 
think of the occasions when some art was acquired or somebody gifted it and that led to reminiscing about nostalgic stories about family members who have passed on like my uncle who was a avid collector and very often every piece had a story or some anecdote associated with it so as a family we recollected and sort of reminisced about that particular event and all those little little things did happen so i think uh, we certainly did enjoy and of course one more thing that we did was to rearrange a lot of it in the house because uh, you sometimes felt that you know this would be better there and something else so uh, a lot of that went of course for first two months we didn't have any one coming home including a carpenter or somebody but then later on when they came that's the time when we started refixing some of the artworks at home and that kind of led to uh, a, a little bit of a refreshed look if you may say of certain portions of the house but one thing i if you permit me rudrangshuda i would like to add uh, when we are all talking about the impact of this uh, massive event the pandemic and on on all of us uh, see i don't think in any of our living memory have so many of the brightest people in the world been actually locked up at home for such a long period of time now one of the things that it has done is that it has forced a lot of us to rethink about life and priorities and about a host of issues which probably uh, i think uh, everyone will agree that a very large part of our day was actually spent in various social pursuits and various other activities which were not core or essential to our being and they were costing us a lot of time and energy and leaving us a little bit sapped and exhausted as a result we were never doing that kind of deep thinking uh, at least uh, for most active people uh, for a large part of their life now suddenly you know the first week you probably recoup from all the fatigue that you have but once you get used to that and you find long hours of doing nothing and there's a limit to how much time you can speak to your wife and children and the few people you are sort of locked in with so there is a lot of time that you actually sit and you are awake and you are not tired that you actually start thinking deeply and that to me is a very very important cathartic process which i believe would lead to tremendous change in the world uh, when we emerge from this crisis obviously we don't know how long this will last the last time it lasted a couple of years i hope this is shorter but Uh, we shouldn't second guess what the almighty has in store so it may be still a long winter for us and it might be uh, several months if not years before we can come back to normal all this is going to force us into a new kind of thinking and when i say this i extend it to all the art community because when we have seen and you're a historian so you would know it better than most of us that some of the best art and the best literature and the best songs have emerged from deep sense of pain and we have to agree that this pandemic has caused all kinds of pain to all kinds of people uh even those of us who have been lucky to be at least having uh, a roof over our heads and probably no physical pain of the kind that some of the migrant workers and others have faced we have other kinds of pain our businesses have got destroyed someone's careers have got impacted someone's uh, you know profession has been sort of uh, disturbed more importantly there are many many friends and where, for instance my chitima parima mrs bimla potar is in varanasi and she was there when this lockdown happened and we are very close to her she is almost like my mother and for the last so many months we haven't seen her except through zoom and uh, she of course has a full establishment so she's comfortable and happy there but you know it it has really made my heart ache in a way that it has never ached before uh, of not being able to give her a hug and uh, and i see her on zoom and tears roll down my eyes 
because I just feel the need to go and give her a hug. Uh, and we haven't done because she refuses to allow me to fly there. And obviously she is very old, so she cannot come. So there are things like that, that I think each one of us have experienced. And I think that pain does some wonderful things to us. It forces us to pull out some of those hidden aspects of us, which we would have never been able to pull out. I don't think I would have uh, relived moments or felt the way I felt if I had not experienced this pain. And it's not always pleasant, but I am sure that it leads to some amazing amount of creativity, uh, amazing amount of release of energy, and more so with the artistic community, I feel. And I feel that immediately following this pandemic uh, sort of uh, redressal, we will come out with a burst of art that this world has not seen in a very, very different way than we have ever seen before. It's not going to be incrementalism to me. It's not going to be a refinement just of technology, materials, etc. It's going to be an expression of a certain kind of experience that we have undergone during this lockdown, which is so unusual and so once in a century that there would have been no parallel to this. And of course, God forbid it comes again, but whenever it does, it does. Hopefully most of us won't live for seeing the next tragedy of this scale and magnitude. But this is to me the biggest gain that we will get out of it. Of course, in the short run, there are many and we are all privileged in this room who have enough probably to last out this crisis. But there are so many artists and so many people who are out there who are absolutely hungry, dying of destitution, dying without food. And that is truly a challenge. So there, it's not that this tragedy and this event is going to go without a huge cost. But through that also, there is going to be some very interesting flowering which couldn't have happened without this kind of a major event. Thank I couldn't you. agree with you more, Harsh, that this crisis has actually made uh, us more reflective individuals than we were before this crisis. Uh, we all had to look deep into ourselves and the reality around us. Uh, and I also agree with you that the pain, directly or indirectly, that all of us are suffering uh, or enduring or watching people suffer is going to bring about an, uh, a new kind of artistic creativity. To, re to repeat that cliche, our uh, sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Uh, and we are going through a very, very sad period of the world's history. So uh, the crisis will probably produce different kinds of artistic expression. Uh, when the crisis is over, if it is over, uh, so the big question. So, uh, Monica Shai, uh, I haven't kept you in, in the, as the last because you're the least. Um, it's quite the opposite. I think you can bring into this discussion a completely different perspective because you are not only an appreciator of art, Maybe you are a collector as well, I don't know that, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you are a collector, but uh, you are also a diplomat. And uh, what do you think has been, or has been the role of a diplomat who is interested in art, in promoting, sponsoring, preserving the interaction between artists and uh, the community of people who appreciate art, who write about art, and what role can diplomacy play or has played? Do you have any reflections on, the, on these matters? And if you do, please do share them with us. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's been such an honor to be uh, on this panel and able to listen to all of the other illustrious panelists. Um, you know, this is the reason that I came to Kolkata. I, uh, I chose to come here. I wanted to come here. I had served in India and Bangladesh previously. And I, um, I wanted to be in a city that appreciated art. Um, I'm a New Yorker. That's another city that appreciates art. 
Um, but you know, for me, it was a big disappointment when uh, the pandemic, you know, lockdown started. I came about a year ago uh, this month, or actually, no, it's September already. I came a year ago in July, um, and I got to do my job. My job is to connect American and Indian people to find those connections, and very often those connections are through art, visual art, music, literature, writing. Um, you know, many of you may have been to our American Center. We used to have 300 people coming in almost every day, either to use the library or to go to a program. I love all of this. This is why I do my job. This is why I have the job that I have. I, I love it. And so for me to shut down the American Center and for me to not be able to host in-person programming, musical events, poetry events, literature events, um, and, and other kinds of events as well to bring students into the American Center University <laughs> um, has been a real, you know, a real disappointment. And, you know, I'm not here for, you know, year after year, decade after decade. I get, I get two years in this city. And so, um, so for me, it's been, a, it's, it's been a real disappointment. However, however, I have to say, I've been absolutely astonished by the way that, that Kolkata and, and really, you know, other, other states in Eastern India that take part in our programming have, have continued to join with us online. And I've been astonished at how our programs have actually been able to continue to reach people, even though they're virtual. And I didn't expect that. So, you know, my job is to bring together American and Indian people, and particularly Indian people in Eastern India. Um, the Kolkata Consular District is actually 11 states of India. So all of the seven states um, of the seven sisters, and then Jharkhand and Bihar. Um, so how do I reach these people without traveling? You know, before the lockdown, I was able to travel to uh, Guwahati, to Ranchi. Um, I traveled out, you know, to different parts of the consular district. So, you know, my question when all this happened was, will people, will people to continue to talk to us? Will people come to our online programs? Um, you know, one of the programs that we did kind of early on uh, was, was a program to commemorate the um, birth anniversary of Rabindranath Tagore. And, you know, everything that I do has an American angle. So, you know, we, we talked about ways, you know, ways that Tagore had been influenced by Americans on his five trips to the United States, and then how Tagore in turn influenced Americans. Um, so it was a really interesting program, but, but I didn't know how many people would show up. 136,000 people viewed or engaged in that program. I was absolutely shocked. And then later we had a program called California to Kolkata where we had a, a California musician who had been a Fulbrighter and Shanti Niketan um, collaborate with a Bengali musician based here. Um, they practiced together, they played together. You know, we had 42,000 people watch and engage in that program. So we are, it's, it's amazing to me that we are still able to make those cultural connections, which is my work, which is my job, uh, even during the pandemic. And you know, the other part of my work and my job is, um, is kind of to have conversations around these shared values and shared kind of foreign policy objectives. So, you know, one of the things that the American consulate does here in Eastern India is we work on anti-trafficking. Uh, this is one of our big issues. Um, every year we have big conclaves, we pull people together. And here in Eastern India, what I find absolutely fascinating is how art is such a strong part of that. I think our, our strongest emotions, our deepest emotions, they're expressed through art. I think we all know that, we all appreciate that. So why would we not use art as a medium and culture as a medium to talk about things like trafficking, like human trafficking, or economic inclusivity, or gender empowerment, or even the Indo-Pacific connectivity? Why not talk about these things through the lens of culture and art? And the pandemic, you know, it's, it's been a big obstacle, but it has not stopped these kinds of conversations. And so, you know, we, I, I don't know if people know this, but the US Department of State actually has what we call an arts envoy program. So we pay for artists to come to different areas of the world to engage on various issues. And, you know, you've seen American artists coming through Kolkata years and years. Uh, you, you might've heard Herbie Hancock, who was here, Wayne Shorter. 
Um, but you know, we continue to bring artists. And now, virtually, uh, we have brought artists in for a program called Our Shared Story, uh, where we're, we're talking digitally and, um, and making digital art and digital stories about gender and race and our biases and inclusivity and all of these things that, that my country is grappling with and that India also grapples with. And these are conversations that we can all have together, but having them through the medium of puppetry, of theater, of role play, of visual art, makes it so much more powerful and so much more personal. So I would just say that, you know, we, we do continue to use um, art to connect, even though I think it is more challenging and I cannot wait. I mean, I, I appreciate the isolation and I'm a bit of an introvert and I love to read. So all of that is great. But, you know, I'm here in the city because I want to be in the city. I would, I would love to be on an actual, you know, stage with all of you <laughs> so that I could interact in a more personal way. Um, but this is what we have for now. So th this is what we're doing. And I, I think we still need to use these platforms, you know, to give voice to each other. Um, one of two things I'll mention, and then I'll wrap it up because I know we're getting a little past eight o'clock. Um, I have a teenager in this house with me. I think it's really especially difficult for young people. Um, so one of the things that we try to do is, is give a platform for young people to, you know, to get a little bit dressed up and to put on their camera and to recite a poem or to play some music. And so our English Act Micro Scholarship Access Program, uh, which offers English classes to underprivileged children for free, um, you know, we're still connecting with them virtually. Sometimes they have to, you know, share, share a phone or something like that, but we figure it out. And then they're able to connect with each other, which I think is so important during these times that, you know, the children and the young people are not isolated because for them, it's even more important to connect. And they too love to connect through, through the arts, through digital storytelling, through, you know, reciting a poem to, a, to another group of people, through talking about a book in a book club, um, and through, through musical connections as well. So Maya, I don't turn on the air conditioning, so my, um, my camera keeps fogging up. <laughs> um, so the last thing I'll say is that I do know uh, that musicians are holding uh, virtual concerts. And as has already been mentioned by other panelists, they're struggling. Um, so I think you know, what I'm trying to do and what I encourage everyone to do is to buy that ticket, buy that 100 rupee ticket, um, pay for that virtual performance so that we can support our artists and our musicians in this, in this very difficult time. Um, thank you so much for including me in this panel. It's been a real learning experience. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Now, uh, I have left a very big, a million dollar question to the end. And uh, because this is going to be a tough one for all of you, uh, but, and you only have two, two to three minutes to respond to it, each of you, the same question. And I'll start with Harsh because I know he, he's in a bit of a rush. He has to go. He has got guests coming. The question is this. It comes directly from the title of the panel discussion. The crucial role of art in a time of global crisis. I am asking you this question, all of you. And I will take, I'll tell you who comes after who. But I'll start with Harsh and Koshik comes after that. Uh, so Koshik can start thinking about it. Does art have to have a role? Forget global crisis, the pandemic, etc. The big question: Does art have to be? A, does art have to have a role? Role where? Role for the artist? Role for society? Role what? So, it's a provocative question, and I think we have we will have very different answers to this question. So, Harsh, you're you are the first. Well, Rudrangshuda, you're a professor of history and know better than you to know that over several millennia, art has never lost its relevance. And I have no reason to believe that a microbe like the coronavirus can do anything to threaten the very need, nature, or the need for its existence. Yes, one thing will certainly happen is that art will begin to be consumed in more innovative and different ways than perhaps it was happening because any cataclysmic event in the world tends to create a bend in the road, if I may use the word. Now, what is that bend and how it exactly is going to manifest itself? 
is for us to wait and see. But the short answer is that yes, art will continue to be relevant, perhaps even more so. Art is not just for the artist. It is a way of you communicating to the world at large an idea. And you do that through various mediums. You do it through theater. You do it through visual art. You do it through music. You do it through cinema, all of which are different forms of art. When a pandemic hits, it changes the world order. People are forced to, to recalibrate their life and perhaps even look at various kinds of uh, activities that they did, whether they are any more relevant to them. For instance, I do feel that there will be a reset in conspicuous consumption. I do feel that there will be a reset in perhaps focusing on lifestyle will be less important than health. I, I do think that people's uh, disposable income towards food and therefore organic food will increase and they will spend more money on food and perhaps a propensity to consume less healthy food or junk food will be somewhat reduced. I do believe that people will go for a more healthy routine in terms of yoga, exercise, sport, what have you. And I do feel that people will take to uh, the idea of doing perhaps a break every year to reflect and think because they have found value in that which perhaps in the past they might have thought is a waste of time. Uh, these are the kind of changes that I, I hope, I expect. Uh, I would be really disappointed that we totally missed using this crisis if this kind of transformation doesn't happen to humanity. Thank you, Harsh. Koshik, I'll bring you in next because I know you personally and I know your work. I know you see yourself as a committed artist. So what do you think is the role of art? Uh, we were talking about invisible enemies, but I would like to bring in the visible enemies also. Because at this very moment, the right-wing extremism in our country is growing like anything. And all the intellectuals, artists, whether they are uh, uh, from literature, they're painters, they're actors, all of them, according to the ruling party, they are whoever speaks against the ruling party, the ruling force, they are labeled as anti-national. They are labeled as the enemy of the state. This is a, a, a very crucial situation, not only the pandemic, because uh, the pandemic is not affecting the quality of the politics in our country. The politicians in our country, as usual, they are lying and they're trying to hide themselves behind this pandemic and they're continuing their, uh, you know, their, their threats. They are saying all sorts of lies and that's the reason why on the first time I talked about listening to them. So theater, which is different from the other other art forms is that theater is a time limited art. You cannot keep theater in your drawing room or you cannot hang a theater in the walls or no patrons can buy a theater and put into his store. Theater has to happen in front of your eyes and it starts in the evening, right from 6.30 to, and it begins at nine. Tomorrow, if you watch a theater, it's not the same theater you are watching. It's completely a new kind of a thing. So theater, I believe that it has to be, it has to modify, to rethink, readjust themselves and bring out something new. And theater has that power. Rudhanshuda, this is the time when I think we must go back to Badal Sarkar. It's a long time we have been uh, discussing, we practiced, uh, theaters of Shomu Mitro, Utpal Dotto, we talked about these two stalwarts of Indian theater. But what I believe this is the time to reread, to re examine the third theater which Badal Sarkar created so that we can move on to the community. We must connect to the community, not through proscenium theater anymore, because this is the time we should They're come wrong. out. We should come out and do a different kind of works in theater, not only to combat the invisible enemy, but also the visible enemies. Thank you, Koshik. Uh, Ilan, may I bring you in here? Sorry, Hush. 
I, I just need to leave my guests. Thanks, as thanks, well. thanks. I hope we haven't kept you too long. Thank no, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ilan, uh, you began uh, today's discussion with uh, talking about engagement and a sense of interiority. Uh, so how do you see this question about the role of art and the role of artists? So, uh, you know, it was interesting to hear the various aspects of this discussion from teacher to uh, theater and each one suffered differently. I, I am in the crossroad in art that I show in galleries and museum, but I also show public art. So I think that for me, public art probably will be the way to go, you know, to concentrate on that because that doesn't rely on the hall of the famous hall of art, the museums and the gallery, and that's in nature and naturally, um, or oh, in cities. And that naturally will change somewhat uh, the aspect of art. It's have to be bigger. It have to um, relate to a tree that stands behind your art. You know, it's not only the white box as we know out in the museum and galleries. And so, uh, that's a direction that I was going uh, before, and I will probably continue uh, more easily to go through uh, than my exhibition itinerary and things like that. So, but to other aspects, um, I, I think that the theater that I love and learn a lot from, uh, and in, it influenced my art, especially in the years I spent in England, it will have to move to the street somehow or into Zoom or into other aspects of theater, at least for a while. And the, you know, the, whole, the famous line, the whole world is a stage, will become, you know, uh, more pertinent to this. Uh, as for teaching art, which I also taught in university for years, um, I think it's really welcome, you know, you just kind of break away from the traditional uh, mold of teaching and students will have to find a little more isolated uh, and individualistic way of finding their way. So the role of teacher will have to be a little more distant, but uh, allowing a growth in, in finding new material, finding new environment. Uh, yeah, probably bronze will have to wait a little bit, but uh, the chair in your kitchen might become part of your art, you know. Uh, and so the, methodolo the methodology of finding solution will be there. Um, and so, you know, I think it will force us all to find different, uh, because art is about communication, uh, different way to communicate and different ways to, of material, different way to express oneself. But it won't stop us, you know, because that's what we know how to do. We don't know how to do other things. And so um, that's what we know and that's what we will do. And I think the, the talk about the silence and the concentration of oneself, one library, one walls in the house, in the case of Harsh, it's a wonderful description of how you uh, relearn to appreciate what you have done before without uh, the barrage of life. So these are all positive things. I also think that we will have to do, deal with uh, the political aspect, as was mentioned. Um, uh, you know, there is a big political issues right now at stakes and both in India and where I am in the States um, or where I come from in Israel, that really have to be dealt with and they will be dealt with uh, in Israel, there is a lot of theater right in front of the uh, prime minister house as a form of demonstration and and big time uh, theater and big time the Philharmonic is there and so demonstrating. So uh, it's innovative and it's creative and it's fun to look in the next morning newspaper or television uh, what's going on there, you know, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Monica, uh, you've already in your very brief presentation, you've actually touched upon, and that's your presentation provoked this, my question in a way. Uh, you've already spoken about the role that art and artists are already playing, uh, you know, as you see it in Calcutta from your perch, uh, and you regret that 
Uh, it's not becoming more inclusive. Uh, you, you are not out there as it were. Uh, will you like to elaborate a little more about what you see the role of art? You can be very specific about the role of art in Calcutta, for example, which is the territory to which you, not within your control, but the territory on which you have to remain committed to for the next couple of years. Exactly. Um, thank you. The, the, I'll, I'll be pretty short. I mean, for me, the role of art is always critical. I mean, art is the way that we communicate in the most basic human way. Um, for me, as a diplomat, if I want to really, you know, have an impact or to, you know, communicate about really any subject at all, if I can do that through art and culture, it will be that much more impactful. It will be that much stronger. So um, I believe that during these crisis times, we need our artists more than ever. We need them to help us understand the situations that we're in. Uh, you asked me about Kolkata. I think we need our artists you know, here, now, um, even, even at the table to help us understand political issues, um, to help us understand the NRC or the CAA, just the way artists in the United States are helping us to understand the Black Lives Matter movement. I think we need our artists to help us you know, through theater, through song, through music, through dance, through literature, through whatever it is, um, to understand these social changes that we're all going through. Um, I think artists should be at the table for policy discussions. I think they have a lot to add and I think their medium is, is one of the strongest that we can use to really understand each other as people, uh, which is what the world always needs uh, during any kind of crisis, including this one. Thank you. Um... I'll keep Helen to the last, uh, so the two teachers. Pankaj, will you respond to my question? If you, if you don't want to, it's fine. I mean, but do you have a response to this question about the role of art and the role of artists, not just in a pandemic or in a global crisis? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the relevance of art will never, you know, never diminish. That is, that is, I strongly believe, with time, it will keep on innovating. Uh, especially in pandemic time, I mean, all of the tragedies, as you know, I mean, one of the uh, most iconic work which represents the tragedy is Gurnika. So that, you know, that, you know, uh, I, you know, that, that, once you look at that, the, the Spanish civil, uh, this thing, uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, revolution is, you know, it comes into your mind. So that is such an iconic work. Nobody can, you know, it, it can crystallize in time that period that what happened in that period of history and that remains forever. I think one of the greatest work of art in that sense. Similarly, I will give one example because art has multiple roles like one of the French cartoonists when there was a terror attack in Nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came out with uh, immediate uh, response. It was like her urge to take out whatever she knew and respond how the world is going towards. These are the various ways, but that is the way, that is the way she's an art, also an artist. And through drawing, it came out. I will give one another example in India, how tragedy uh, affects an artist. And it, 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 you know, it so deeply affects him that all his life, that comes out. That example is Indian uh, artist Somnath Hol. When you see his bronzes, you will never forget the Bengal famine. You know, that bronzes, you know, because luckily I was student here when he was teacher. So, but the, what I am interested in is when art form takes uh, uh, inspiration or it, it's triggered by some tragedy or that kind of situation, it should reach a stage where you know it, it, it can involve a viewer in a much a deeper level. It is not like a poster art or protest art. They are also a form of art. But this kind of art you know, takes you much deeper where you can look, you are looking at a very tragic event, but it is keeping you engaged. It is keeping you mesmerized. And it is so deep that you can feel that, that pathos. So I, I, I like that, that that is, you know, real poetry and visual art. Similarly, one example I will give that Seema Gallery when they organized this uh, on the 25th anniversary of Seema 
gallery that's at the iconic location of Gem Cinema. It's a very tragic location. So when they invited artists from all over India to respond, so it was a fantastic, you know, what that the, the same thing, how the tragedy triggers artists in different ways. So when first time I was one of the participating artists, and when I went there, it struck you. And then you don't know how to respond, whether respond historically, whether respond very logically, and uh, nothing was working for me. I was just, I was just spellbound. And, and, and very rightly, I mean, like Ilan mentioned, that, you know, something came out and you don't know from where it came out, a shadow of a plane. And I did that work. And I thought, I think it reasonably came out very effective with that pathos, with that tragic, dark, you know, that emotions, but something which can engage you. So to me, art will always innovate itself in all over, in whichever situation comes, whether tragedy or this thing, art has such a powerful, you know, as a tool. And the secondly, art, art can... Uh, art we are running short of time. May I uh, ask you to be a little brief? What I'm saying is, art is giving me that kind of thing that during pandemic time, it's almost a learning time for me. So I'm re-educating myself in many ways. So with Chhatrapati come in, uh, response to the question, I'm, I'm afraid I'll have to uh, kind of impose a time limit. So two minutes, please. Otherwise, we yeah. won't have any Thank time for uh, Thank you, interaction with the audience. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, 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 for me, given uh, any point of time in human civilization, basically the role of art has been that of a chronicler, and I think that's that's one of the greatest roles that art has played and will continue to play. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, given uh, that you know, either in the form of a propagation vehicle of social belief systems, as as we found in caves or catacombs or cathedrals, temples, mosques. Uh, uh, imambaras, wherever, state buildings, or, you know, uh, art has always played the role of documentation of spaces, flora and fauna, or even at other times becoming mirrors for, you know, voicing psychological, cultural and political realizations and discourse. Basically, I think every sort of art in some uh, way or the other will fit into these categories. And that's the role ultimately for me uh, uh, that art has played and will uh, remain to play in the historic sense as well as uh, uh, he, as a contributor to uh, human civilization. And I think I'll agree that with Pankajda that, you know, uh, I mean, whoever would have uh, heard of a little village called Guernica until uh, Picasso uh, reacted to it uh, just two months after uh, the bombing of that village, uh, a small village in uh, you know, th it, it's 1934, uh, 36. So, you know, by now, until there was Picasso doing that, uh, we would have long forgotten this village. But uh, at the same time, I will also just come back and agree with Koshik that, that, you know, in spite of a time where we are in a situation of global cooperation in terms of, you know, uh, science and technology, in terms of uh, you know, uh, social systems, uh, uh, commerce and financial systems. But at the same time, uh, there is the global rise of, you know, what we call nationalism today in, a, in different forms. And I think it is very important that uh, we address this today. And artists uh, are, I think, parallelly uh, facing both uh, uh, points of crisis at the same time. And I think uh, one of the ways uh, that, you know, today we, we uh, the, to, to really address this because the bigger systems are taking up uh, all the space. I think we need to uh, really get to, uh, you know, stopping this uh, way of uh, getting away our uh, secularist position. And we need to form uh, smaller unions uh, of people, like-minded people, smaller communities. And at the same time, at personal levels, whoever of us who are in the creative field, I think, uh, deconstruct the syntax that already prevailed and uh, uh, make a new construction that can address this time. I think that's very important. Thank you. Helen. 
I, I'm, I'm going to brief. be brief. I'm sorry about this. I'm, so, I'm <laughs> going to be extremely brief because for me, the oxygen of life is art. Without art, one cannot exist. Whether, you know, the hand, which is a symbol of survival in our mechanized society, the body in which movement through dance and theater, the voice through song, you know, all of these, and, and poetry, which, is, which elevates language, all of these are fused together. And it is art that gives us life. I think the real terrible crisis during this time is the poverty, the lack of jobs, and the and the devastation of our institutions and our ability to bring all these forces together into a public cohesiveness. So that is what is important to me, that art is our oxygen. You know, from the very beginning of civilization, you go into a cave and you find drawings and you find shards, you know, and you think, where did this come from? How did they learn? So I thank you for this opportunity to participate with all of you in a country that I dearly, dearly love and has been part of my life since 1986. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, we have a little bit of time left for uh, a Q&A session, uh, but as I look at the, question and, uh, the questions that have been posed, a large majority of them by far are just comments. There are no questions. And there are some questions which are actually, they do not have any bearing on either the discussion or the subject that is being discussed. So I'm going to ignore those. And, you know, there are, thank you, Mr. Neotia, for giving us your thoughts. Uh, I mean, I hardly needs to be put on a question answer session. So I'm just picking out some of the, what I consider, this is a subjective choice some of the relevant discussions. So it's Shujoy Mukherjee, who just identifies himself as an assistant professor. I don't know where. Uh, he, she, he says, I'm not sure about this definite divide between theory and practice. And this may be typical uh, that art history, then he says P-R-O-Y, which I think is a typo, to certain exclusion that I feel is problematic. Uh, Chhatrapati Dato, I think you raised the question of uh, the division between theory and practice. Would you like to respond to that? Uh, well, I don't think there's much to say about this. I think we were discussing how academics could be carried on in a situation like the pandemic. And uh, uh, this was not actually trying to say that theory and practice are two different things in visual art or any other uh, form of art. So I don't think we, this needs to be addressed. So Indra Pramit Rai, who is, a, as all of you know, a practicing artist, a very talented practicing artist, uh, suggests that this crisis and the cusp that in which we are caught, the transition that we are going to make, which Harsh Nyutia delineated rather poignantly, he says uh, this might lead to hybrid forms of art where artists will begin to use various different kinds of techniques, forms, et cetera, et cetera. Would any of you like, would any of you like to uh, come in on that, comment on it? It's an interesting idea. Uh, maybe Pankaj, because you spoke about innovation. You're on mute, Pankaj. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think. I mean, this. That is what I. I. I think that this eight or nine month of total lockdown has given us enough uh, uh, time to reflect and develop a new kind of new ways of how to develop our art. And exactly, I'm sure uh, this teaching methodology and the way students are, you know, we are discussing ideas new methods, new technology, new way of looking at are more interdisciplinary forms of art. I think they are going to come out. And every time art has emerged out of crisis with a new new shape and form. Can I say something? Yes. Scrolling yeah. down to see yeah. if there are any other interesting questions. Yeah. All right. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ilan, would you like to come in there? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, there is a great line that I think De Buffet, the artist, uh, French artist, um, said, art never lies in the bed we prepare for. Uh, so <laughs> we just have to wait, you know, to see where it's going. But yeah. I think it's, uh, it's true. I think that it's... Uh, what kind of form of art will come of it? That's the big mystery and the big curiosity, which makes us so interesting. Uh, so that's where it will, will go. You know, we have to uh, end this movie with a question mark, you know, uh, uh, where is it going to go and wait patiently uh, and see. And maybe there won't be oh, an uh, So uh, uh, one minute, uh, Koshik, here's a question for you. I think it's a great relevance and might provoke you to provide an answer. And it, it comes from a theater person as well. Uh, so she, I think it's a she's, pardon me if it's not. Uh, how do you think any form of art can affect the majority of the people in a country like India, where the majority of the people are too poor to know anything about art? So do you think, Koshik, in terms of this question, uh, that your emphasis on Badal Shorka's theater can act as a bridge between the urban theater viewer and the majority of the people. Absolutely. I mean, the theater needs to shift. Theater needs to come out of the proscenium. Theater needs to change its color. And uh, one major problem we have in our country that after our independence, uh, we were very fortunate to have a national school of drama. But in a country like India, you cannot have just one national school of drama where we speak so many languages, so many cultures, so many you know, kind of different kind of practices. So it's, it's very odd that we still, uh, we have just one national school of drama in New Delhi, which uh, tries to teach a theater to a one particular language that is Hindi. This is something <laughs> ridiculous. So, uh, you know, th this is one of the reason why theater haven't uh, got the scope of communicating so much to the society. And what are they doing in National School of Drama? After passing out the students, when after passing out from the National School of Drama, they are going to the, uh, either, either to the Bombay film industry or other regional film industry. They're not being able to practice theater anymore. So uh, a lot of things are there. A lot of problems are there as far as theater is concerned. But at the same time, I, what I really feel that this is the time the theater must shift its position. It must come out from the closet of the, you know, you know some intellectuals, some uh, from a particular community and tries to build up something very, very different. Otherwise, theater won't be able to survive. And online is not the answer. We have to communicate physically with the audience. So I will just draw a broad generalization from what Koshik has said. Art needs to go out or to come out of the closet as it were and reach out to the people. And that will only increase, if I may borrow Helen's phrase, increase the supply of oxygen to the people. Uh, so I will, uh, reasons of time, I will stop. I, I want to thank Helen, Ilan, Koshik, Monica, Chhatrapati, Pankaj, and Harsh, who is not here for a very fruitful and engaging discussion this evening. We all go away from this uh, with too many thoughts, actually, an embarrassment of riches, if I may say so. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope we can do it again very soon on another equally provocative subject. Thank you. Good evening, wherever you are, in whichever part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you so much on behalf of SEMA.